today. My name is Cindy Cohen, and I'm the legal director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, thank you. This, uh, this talk will be uh, apparently talk two of what is an EFF trifecta here today at uh, DEF CON, because at 6 o'clock tonight, um, with the, the, the kind approval of Agent X and the DEF CON folks, we're going to hold a special session just to talk about the RIAA versus the people, all the subpoenas that have been coming out. We want to talk, you know, kind of give you guys some straight talk about what's been going on, uh, where we think things are going in the future, um, what we're thinking that we can do about it at EFF, but actually I think most importantly, so let's start a brainstorm together to decide what we can all do about it together. Um, but today I'm going to talk about something different. Um, I want to talk about uh, our dear friend Mr. Ashcroft and his friends uh, up in uh, Washington, D.C., and what they've, uh, what's been going on since uh, September 11th. Um, because uh, one of the things that was most disturbing to us uh, in the aftermath of the uh, Two Towers attacks on September 11th is that suddenly we started seeing all sorts of legal changes that were aimed at hackers. And, um, you know, hackers had nothing to do with the blowing up of those two buildings and the killing of those 3,000 people. Um, but yet, suddenly it seemed to be an extremely opportune time for some folks in the Justice Department to decide to ratchet up uh, the situation facing people who are involved in, in hacking. Um, so I wanted to talk kind of about those kinds of changes and I think what hackers, the title of this is what hackers need to know about the law since September 11th. Um, this is a, a talk that I give um, in a, this is a shorter version of a talk that I give in about a four hour training session for all sorts of activists. Um, and, uh, and usually it is um, designed around a set of scenarios which you'll find on the CD that you got. Uh, where we talk about, you know, some, some scenarios, you know, the police show up at your door, um, you know, you decide to do, a, you and your friends decide to do a denial service attack against somebody who you don't like, or you build a software tool to help build freedom, and, and talk about the law in those contexts. Um, this is a much shorter time frame, so I'm going to talk just about the legal changes, and then I want to answer your questions. Um, I'm happy to talk a little more about the scenarios that are in the materials if folks want to, but I, I, I think with this crowd, getting over the overview and to the questions as soon as possible is more important than kind of the, the baseline, what do you do when the cops show up at your door stuff. Um, so, you know, catch me in some other presentation and you can hear the whole thing. It's a lot of fun. Um, the, the USA Patriot Act uh, is the main thing I want to talk about because it did the major change to uh, computer hacking offenses. Uh, the, the, you know, USA Patriot Act was passed a few weeks after the September 11th attack as a response to try to make us safer from terrorism. Um, as I pointed out, uh, hackers had nothing to do with the terrorist attacks. But nonetheless, we saw a whole raft of provisions in the law that changed in some pretty dramatic ways the legal landscape involving hacking offenses. Um, frankly, when the bill started out, uh, it had even worse things in it. Um, and due to some good work uh, on behalf of uh, my organization and several other organizations, and uh, especially actually Kevin Polson at Security Focus Magazine, uh, we got some of the worst stuff out of the bill, frankly. Um, but it's still pretty bad. Um, the, the big, the, the, a major series of the changes happened to a law called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And if, uh, if you're a hacker at all, you should know about this law. It's the basic federal hacking law, and there are similar laws in almost every state in the country, and they all follow a same pattern. They make it illegal to exceed the authority in a protected computer that, and, and cause more than $5,000 worth of damage. Um, again, the damages amount changes from state to state. But the keywords there are exceeding the authority in a protected computer. And what does exceeding the authority mean? Well, um, it's a little gray, but we've got some clear pictures about what it does mean. If you're tapping into a computer uh, where you don't have authority to have access, let's say you're going into a government computer or you know, AT&T's computers, and you don't have the authority to do that, you are exceeding the authority in a protected computer because you don't have any authority to begin with to be there. Um, similarly, if you've got um, an account that lets you do certain things on a computer and you decide instead that you want to become root and do a lot of other more interesting things, you are exceeding your authority in a protected computer. Um, so that's the idea, you know. What, what do you have permission to do? Um, and if you're outside of those permission things, you're exceeding the authority. Now, there's a lot of places in the law where this is really vague, and it's been applied in some pretty strange ways, in my opinion. Um, but um, that's the basic idea. Um, 
uh, what, protected computer, what does that mean? Well, that means any computer used in interstate commerce. Um, that's the federal keywords for how, how can the feds rule, make a law about this. Um, and what does that mean in practice? That means any computer connected to the internet. Um, there's no leeway in this, that's what it means. So if you're using the internet, you're coming over the internet to get into somebody's computer and you don't have the authority to be there, you're under CFAA jurisdiction because that's a protected computer. There's a subset of computers that are called, that, um, that I'm trying to remember the name, I think it's called government computers that are any computer that's owned by or used by the government. Um, and that can actually include people who are governmental contractors who are working on things as well. That's another subset of CFAA and the penalties there are more severe. We'll talk about it a little bit, but remember that even if it says protected computer, that doesn't mean a government computer. That means any computer on the internet. There's another category for when you're going after the government's computers. And both got worse under the Patriot Act. So that's the basic law. And the law said before, September 11th and still does that you have to you have to cause about five thousand dollars worth of damage to meet the minimum threshold to be liable under the law it has both criminal and civil liability so not only can the government come after you under CFAA private parties who you hurt let's say you go into an AT&T computer AT&T can sue you under CFAA as well it has joint authority um, so that's the kind of basic law now what changed in the Patriot Act? Well, a lot of things changed after the Patriot Act. The first thing is, um, it used to be if the government was uh, uh, believed that you were hacking into a computer, um, they couldn't go get a wiretap after you. Um, wiretaps are traditionally the kind of thing the government can only get for a small select category of really serious offenses. And CFAA offenses did not used to be on the list for wiretap offenses. Well, thank you, Congress, they now are. So they can get a wiretap after against you if they think you're doing CFAA things. Um, they, the law changed such that if you have an attempt to, ex, to, uh, to break into a protected computer, you are now punished as if you had succeeded. Um, so if you try and you still cause $5,000 of damage, that's still there. Um, even if you don't actually succeed in what you're trying to do, uh, you can be liable. Now, how can you be liable? How can you get to $5,000 if you didn't actually succeed? Well, I'll tell you how. It's because they've changed how they count the $5,000. The $5,000 now is much easier. Um, it includes absolutely everything they could possibly think of to do to try to stop you. So if they bring in one guy to try to figure out what those extra pings are, um, you know, and, and, you know, well, one guy might not get you $5,000. Let's say, you know, a guy over a month. Um, and, and it's their internal cost, not how much they pay the guy. Um, they can get to $5,000. If they take steps to close off their network because of something that you do, they can get to $5,000 with that. Um, and then they can get there with the easier, more traditional things like if you actually hurt some from data and they've got to reconstruct something or they lose something of value, then they can get to $5,000. So $5,000 used to be a pretty th low threshold. Now I think it's fair to say in most situations, it almost doesn't exist because um, you can get to $5,000 so easily. And as we've seen, in watching how corporations try to count their damages in technology hacking cases, um, they grossly overestimate how much everything costs. And um, I think it's fair to say that that's not really much of a barrier anymore after the Patriot Act. Um, the other thing that changed about the $5,000 threshold is that you don't need to intend to cause $5,000 worth of damage. There were some earlier decisions that said, well, you know, all he really, all this person really intended to do was go look around. He was just a kid. He wanted to know how the system worked. Um, he was he was engaging in, in, in legitimate inquiry. He may have caused five thousand dollars worth of damage, but that wasn't what he meant to do. Um, well, the Justice Department took care of that one in the Patriot Act. Doesn't matter what your intent is. If you get in and he causes, and they can qualify the damage. That's all that matters. So they they really took care of the. You know, sorry, I didn't mean to, you know, uh, the Robert Morris, I didn't know the worm was going to take down the Internet defense is no longer available for CFAA. Um, so that's changed. And then the other thing is that they've allowed them to aggregate damages. So if you've gone, it's not $5,000 to one computer anymore. It's $5,000 to all the computers owned by a single system. Um, which, as some folks may know, you know, in order to get to a system that you might be interested in looking at, you may go through a couple computers on the way. Um, they can count all those together to get to their $5,000. So that's why I say, you know, I haven't seen a case since Patriot Act passed where $5,000 was not just passed in the wind. That was easy. Um, so CFAA changed a lot. 
Um, and I think it's really important for people who are doing that kind of exploration to think about, um, you know, that, that if you thought you were below the, below the threshold of the law now, um, chances are you might not be. Um, and it's important to, to at least figure that out before you go in. I mean, my, my basic position on this is that, you know, it's not my job to tell you whether to engage in civil, civil disobedience or not. Uh, you're all adults. That's your decision. I think my job is to make sure you don't stumble into it. Um, that you you know the difference, um, and that nobody gets caught and says, "Well, I didn't know that was actually illegal." Um, that's that's kind of how I view my role in um, trying to to give advice to folks on these issues. Um, the other thing that we've seen is that computer crime is now a terrorist offense under USA Patriot Act under certain situations. Um, if you again, it didn't. It, terrorism offenses are a very small category of the law. It used to involve things like blowing up buildings and things like that. Now, suddenly, under Patriot Act, again, no connection to the September 11th bombings or, frankly, any other terrorist attack that we've been able to track in the history, um, suddenly computer crime is on the short list of crimes that qualify as terrorist offenses. Um, now, that's not any computer crime, and it's important to know the limits. Um, it's, it is, first of all, an act that is calculated to influence the government. That's actually, or uh, the government uh, by imitate, in, intimidation or coercion or to retaliate against governmental conduct. Um, so if it's protest type activity or if it's retaliative activity, then you meet the first prong for getting into the terrorist provision. Um, the second prong is that you either must be getting, going after classified information or um, other kind of protected national security sort of information, or, and this is the one that gets tricky, you have to cause damage that causes either a governmental computer system to go down or a medical problem or physical injury. Um, so it's not as bad as it would be if it was just flat any co computer offense, but it, you could see that happening. Um, if you were someone who was assisting, giving computer assistance to people who were involved in protest activities and somebody got hurt at the protest um, uh, as a direct result of something you did, you could end up in the terrorist offense category. Why does that matter? Well, because terrorist defense category is kind of the mother load for punishments, right? Um, it's what we've done with the drug war in terms of ramping up what happens. Uh, what does that mean? That means they can seize your assets. Uh, they can seize your assets first and ask questions later. <laughs> um, they, uh, they can, uh, so they can get pre-conviction forfeiture. That's what, that's what lawyers call seizing your assets. Uh, Post-convictions. And it's an eight-year statute of limitations, which is much longer. There are uh, alternative maximum penalties, which can go up to life imprisonment or the death penalty in certain situations. Um, and it, it allows asset seizure not only of you, but of anybody who is uh, planning, perpetrating, um, or a source of influence over someone engaging in a terrorist activity. And as we've seen in the use of the terrorism laws in the non-computer context, uh, that can include people pretty far away from the actual attack. It can include people who maybe give funds, donate funds, or let you sleep on their couch uh, while you're doing stuff. So um, it's a pretty scary thing to suddenly have computer offenses, uh, which I think were already over-criminalized by the law, suddenly have the specter of, of, of potential terror treating as terrorist offenses now. Um, and again, it's, it puzzles me completely because, again, the hackers didn't have anything to do with any terrorist attacks and haven't ever. Um, the, next, uh, the next category is material assistance to terrorists. Uh, this is a, a category that, got, that existed before the Patriot Act, but got beefed up a lot by the Patriot Act and, and furthered its reach. Um, it, used to, it, it includes training of anyone. So if you train somebody and then they go out and are involved in a terrorist act, you can be held liable as a material assistance to terrorism. And by the way, if you're uh, charged with material assistance to terrorism, the uh, offense carries the same penalties as terrorism itself. So you're not, you know, you're not actually any better for that. Um, and someone who is a facilitator um, is what material, material supports terrorism calls a facilitator. You can be culpable whether or not the underlying offense was committed. And you don't have to have any intent for the specific underlying defense. You only have to know that it's going to be used uh, for, for a specific offense. So um, you don't have to say, well, I wanted to blow up the thing. But, you, but if you know that the person who you're training is going to use it to do some kind of illegal activity, um, even if that wasn't your intent, you're still in, you're still in the loop of this law. Um, 
And, and this all makes us very nervous. It, it gives prosecutors, even if that isn't exactly what you did, it gives prosecutors so much more leeway to start charging people broadly. Um, and, and you know, that's as big a problem as the people who they actually can convict. And we've seen, again, since the Patriot Act is passed, in the name of terrorism and protecting us from terrorists, the prosecutors are really willing to go far beyond what they would normally do in a rational situation about who they're going to charge and what they're going to charge them with. There's a, there's a hysteria going on now. Um, and I, I really worry that some hackers are going to get caught in the crossfire. I should point out that, you know, you know, while I'm scaring the hell out of all of you, that so far this hasn't happened. Um, I'm not aware of any hackers who've been charged under this law yet. Um, but it's disturbing that the law exists. And frankly, it's not the case that we would necessarily know. Uh, most of these kinds of investigations happen under all sorts of gag orders and protective orders. And so it's very difficult to know. Um, but apparently that wasn't enough for the government. They've got a new one that they're, they're thinking about now. It's called Patriot II. Uh, it's DSEA, Defense Security, I don't remember the acronym, actually. Um, it, is, it has been floated, and it has not been put forward. And there was enough noise when it was floated that I'm not sure they're going to go forward with it. Um, so I don't want to scare you too much with it. But it is on the horizon, and certainly it gives a glimpse into what the Justice Department would like to do next. Um, and I think it's quite disturbing that they're already going back to Congress and starting to make noise about how the Patriot Act wasn't enough. Um, um, the first thing that it does, um, I call this in my thing, everyone rats on you whether they want to or not, and they can't tell you about it. Uh, these are things called administrative subpoenas. Um, this is uh, something, again, that existed prior in the law that was very rarely used and gets beefed up a lot by Patriot II. Um, they can be issued by the government. They don't need any court approval. They aren't even reviewed by the courts um, unless, a, unless the person who receives the subpoena objects. Um, and so they just issue these administrative subpoenas to anybody, and that person has to turn over all the information about you that they have. And they almost always come equipped with a gag order, so the person or entity who has to turn over all that information can't tell you. Um, I think these things are one of the scariest things around. Um, the next thing is called a national security letter. Um, it's another way to skin a cat for the government. It's a way they can essentially do the same thing um, under national security grounds, which is require anybody uh, without prior court approval um, to, uh, to hand over any information about you that they have. Um, and the important thing to remember in all of this is, you know, in the digital age, I mean, think, uh, people in this crowd know this, but when I talk to, to non-techies, I always have to point this out. You know, you're leaving bits of data behind with every step online. Um, and so there are lots of people who know lots of things about you, um, unless you're a you know, real, you know, uh, uh, crypto and anonymity junkie and you use those tools and you use them well. There are a lot of people there who know a lot about you. And the idea that they can be required without any court review uh, to just hand over that information to law enforcement, I find rather chilling. You, you had a question? It's, um, it actually, in practice, it comes out of what entity issues it. A national security letter comes out of the kind of um, the, the part of the FBI, the FBI that does the nationals. The FBI kind of has two pieces. There's the domestic and then there's the, the international national security cops, basically. Um, they don't look any different. They don't have to wear any different insignia or anything, but they work in different divisions. And generally, you'll see the administrative subpoenas coming out of the civil domestic side and the national security uh, letters coming out of the other side. So it really, for me as a lawyer, it tells me more about who issued it than it does about the justification. Now, in theory, the, before Patriot, uh, the argument was that the national security people's jurisdiction is just national security sorts of issues and, and foreign governments and spy versus spy sorts of things. And so they would only issue those, you know, when they're doing their work, and their work is national security work. So you could feel kind of safe that a national security letter was only going to be issued for a national security purpose. This is another thing that the Patriot Act did. It tore down all of those laws. Sorry about that. I'm using it for, the, I'm using it for time. But, um, the, it tore down all of those rules that said that, well, the national security people can only be working on national security stuff, and that domestic people can only be working on domestic stuff, and they can't talk to each other unless there's a really high showing. They could always talk to each other a little. Um, uh, uh, you know, the, these kind of walls came up um, in the 70s when it was revealed that the FBI kept uh, dossiers on millions of Americans uh, just in case some of them might be criminals. And so uh, there was a, a, a commission called the Church Commission 
uh, Senator Church uh, put into place, and they put up all these walls between the national security and domestic security, because the reason the FBI said this was because they were going after communists. Um, so they put up all these walls, and Patriot Act tore them largely down. So now you can't really be as sure that a national security letter is actually coming out of a national security purpose as you could before September 11th because the folks on the domestic side can say, you know what, we don't actually have enough authority under our laws to issue a subpoena in this process. And they do have limits and, and internal limits that they follow. So could you guys over there on the right-hand side just issue a subpoena for us and get the information? This is one of the issues that... that, that EFF and the ACLU and EPIC and everyone has with the Patriot Act that's kind of hard for ordinary people to get. Um, but basically it gives the government a lot of different end runs around what used to be the limits on their jurisdiction and this is one of them. Uh, what part of critical infrastructure? Um, the, well, basically, government systems are defined as any system that aid the government in any of its efforts. Um, I could pull out the exact statute, but that's that's roughly it. Uh, telcos that are involved in that kind of work. Uh, it wouldn't be just general telco because the government uses the phone. But it would be a, a, a defense contractor who's developing something for use. It would be somebody in Silicon Valley who's you know developing the next tool of surveillance for the NSA. Hmm? I don't think it'll go that far. It really does have to be for a specific governmental purpose because otherwise there'd be no limit to what a government computer is because the government buys services like the rest of us. There is actually a rational distinction in how it's, how it's defined. And it's, it's really people, I think it's fair to say that you can say it is people who are working under government contracts for things involving national security type stuff are protected. Uh, but not just anybody who sells stuff to the government because that, you know, that, that would be everybody, you know, that would be every big entity, right? Every every big entity would be covered. Um, just earlier today I watched a talk about how you can use certain tools to steal uh, authentication information from unsuspecting users of wireless networks. Uh, would that count as material assistance to potential terrorist offenders? If someone used that in a terrorist-like manner, according to the so the question is, if somebody were to use, um, uh, I, tell me if I'm right about this, but uh, they've asked me to repeat the questions. Um, if somebody were to use a, um, a technique to sniff out passwords from a wireless system they learned that they learned here today, could the person who taught them that uh, be liable if they then use that as part of a terrorist activity? Um, that's the fear. Um, I think, it, you know, I don't, I can't tell you it's completely likely, um, but I think the person who does the teaching has to know that the person who's learning is going to use it for that kind of offense. I don't think it would reach just general teaching. I think that would be really, that would be too far. Um, however, in a place like DEF CON, you might have a hard time arguing that you didn't know that some of the people in your audience were going to use the tools that you're teaching them for a nefarious purpose. You know, thank God we haven't had to go through the kind of thing with DEF CON that we did, say, with Slashdot in the DCSS case where, you know, the 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 entertainment companies put the argument forward that, well, because something happened on Slashdot, you know, you knew a lot of things that I, I don't think made sense to anybody who was a reader of Slashdot. Um, but uh, we haven't done that with the DEF CON sorts of, of conferences yet. And, and you know, uh, hopefully, you know, knock on wood, everybody, that'll never happen. But um, I, I still think it's pretty remote. I think that you really have to have some level of knowledge you don't have to be a co-conspirator like you're working with them, but you have to know that the person you're teaching has that kind of intent, I think, before the law is going to really reach you. Um, yes? So the question is, how does, how does the Patriot Act, uh, the, these changes, affect people who both aren't citizens or who launch whatever they're doing not from the U.S.? Um, the second one's an easier one, and it's one of the things I hate about the Patriot Act. It extended the government's jurisdiction for these kinds of offenses to people outside the U.S. So you know how they swooped down and they got, uh, you know, they've, they've uh, 
uh, recently started really uh, working, well, let me see if I can say this in a nicer way than I was just about to say it. Um, the government has been more aggressive in reaching out to non-citizens who are living in foreign countries and dragging them here for, uh, to, 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 to stand under U.S. laws for things. And the jurisdictional basis for that um, hasn't been fully litigated because, frankly, they didn't do it very often before except for, like, Noriega and some high-profile cases. Um, but and So we'll see that litigated out. Uh, but um, they certainly have now got congressional authority to do that for hacking offenses, which is reach out, grab the guy in Russia who launched the attack, bring him here, and hold them responsible under U.S. laws on the grounds that the effect was here. So um, that, unfortunately, is one of the things that I hate about the Patriot Act. And actually, I think it's really bad law. I think jurisdiction ought to matter. Um, but second, the second question is, um, how would it affect people who aren't citizens? And the answer is it would affect you the same. In some ways, I think it would affect you worse. Uh, because the other part of Patriot that we're not talking about now is all the changes to the immigration laws and the way that the immigration situation has changed now. They could deport you for anything even remotely re related to a Patriot Act uh, defense or a computer crime thing. Um, so not only are you still subject to these laws, as long as you know, this is, this is the basic Cindy theory of jurisdiction that, that I've taught to several hackers uh, so far. So let me just share it all with you all right now. Where do your feet touch the ground? If your feet touch the ground, they can get you there, always. So unless you live in cyberspace and your feet never touch the ground, you're never outside of jurisdiction. You're always under some jurisdiction, at least one where your feet are touching the ground at that moment. Now, you might also be subject to jurisdiction some other places, um, but there is no quick fix that says, well, because it happened on the Internet and it was here and there and I bounced it off here, you know, they can never get me. They may not be able to find you. That's a different question. But they can always get you where your feet touch the ground. And that's where your feet touch the ground where you live or where your feet are happening to touch the ground when they catch you. Um, so if you've broken the British laws and you're not there when you break them, but later you end up going to England and the statute of limitations hasn't passed, your feet touch ground on British soil, they can get you there then. Um, it's, it's a fundamental concept that I think was lost a bit in the early days of the internet because there was this heady idea that you, know, you could be above the law. Um, it's not the case. It wasn't the case then and it's certainly not the case now. We've got a lot of case law on that question. Um, so. Ah, so this is a question. This is a, this is a person who trains uh, foreign nationals uh, for working with, it sounds like, local governments. Um, and he's concerned because he doesn't know what these people's motives are. And some of them are actually on the list, uh, come from countries that are on the, the bad list. Uh, what is your liability responsibility? Well, I think the first thing you have to figure out is who's your boss and what's your arrangement for indemnity uh, and, uh, and responsibility for what you do. If you're a freelancer, I think, we, we, maybe talk to me afterwards, if you're working under somebody else's direction and they're telling you to teach these people, then generally you have uh, a degree of protection as long as you're acting within the scope of what they asked you to do. Um, so if you're training under orders from your bosses, it's your bosses who have to think about the effect. Um, not that you're completely immune, but really, you know, again, you know, um, the other thing is, you know, once you know that they're going to use something for a bad purpose, then I think you need to stop and you need to, to, to take some action. As long as you don't know, I think, again, you're acting under orders from superiors. They're telling you to train these people. I, I think that that's a pretty solid first line of defense. Um, it may not be complete, though, and you still might want to see me afterwards. Yes? Yes. Just portions of it. Um, the part that uh, the most of the CFAA stuff actually sunsets in 2005, not all of it. Um, and so one of the things that you'll start hearing from EFF, I hope you're all members and you get the effector, because then you can watch and you can see when we say it's time for Patriot to expire, start putting pressure on your member of Congress to let it die. 
and not reauthorize it. Um, this is going to be important. The Patriot Act was passed in such a rush. Um, congressmen, I think, felt like they had to do something and look like they were more like they had to look like they were doing something to respond to terrorism. But in 2000, by 2005, hopefully, that pressure will be off of most of them. And news from their constituents that we think you went too far with the Patriot Act. You know, it's time to let some of the stuff that we enacted in haste when there was an emergency just die off and go back to the way that things were before. Really important. I actually think there is a chance that it won't get reauthorized because one of the things about the sunset provisions is, you know, inaction means it goes away. Um, so it's easier to convince members of Congress to do nothing <laughs> than it is to convince them to do something. And we have the benefit here of being able to say, guess what? Just do nothing. Um, and uh, those situations are rare since most of the time when the EFF is concerned about a law, we need it fixed. This is one where we just got to let it die. So that's a good point. Thank you for asking. Yes, in the front. Are, yeah. are federal employees subject to the law as well? Um, in general, the federal employees are, are subject to, to all the laws. They don't, there's not a general federal employee exemption to uh, most laws. So a civilian can take this federal employee to civil court for acts of, uh, uh, for their home computer and cost them more than $5,000 if lost? Um, if, they, if they cause the damage, you probably could. Although, actually, frankly, I should, I should be straighter about that. There is no blanket immunity. But law enforcement purposes is probably one of the ways that they, they would be able to get out from under it. Um, it'd be interesting to try, depending if they really actually cause damage by prodding around in your computer. Real damage, not the kind of phony made-up damage that they get to do, uh, that the corporations get to use. Um, I think it would be an interesting case to try to bring um, an action against the government for, for that. Well, it, it depends on what they're getting. I mean, it wouldn't have to be a warrant. It could be a subpoena, but you're right. Um, it depends on how they're doing it, right? If they're just unauthorized pinging around, though, uh, which they actually do a lot of, um, it'd be interesting, and they actually caused a bunch of damage. It'd be an interesting case to try to bring. I wouldn't say I'm totally optimistic, but it's the kind of thing that might be fun to try and see what happens <laughs> right behind you. They said it's fun to be the EFF lawyer. <laughs> Let's try that. If they're connected to the internet, they're protected computers. Educational computers, I don't think have any, they don't have any federal, special federal protection that I'm aware of. There may be some state laws. What? Well, but they, they wouldn't qualify under protected computers for the special Patriot Act kind of, you know, seventh wall of Dante's, you know, seventh circle of Dante's inferno special penalties that when you go into a government computer. Um, uh, yeah. Not unless, I mean, I, I suspect that there are actually a lot of computers, say, at Berkeley and the Lawrence Livermore Lab and stuff that would, because, that, but, but it's what is the computer doing, not where is it that is the, the, the correct uh, analysis to start. Libraries are getting around some of the provisions by like deleting logs. Oh, thank you for this question. And I was curious if there's any other things like that that we can do. Oh, you just lead me into my conclusion of my talk so well. Thank you. What can you do? Uh, one of the best things you can do, it's funny, I've been joking that EFF is becoming the anti-logging society. Um, <laughs> really, one of the worst problems with a lot of this Patriot Act stuff, and it's the same problem now that the RIAA is taking count of, is that all the sysadmins I know are pack rats, right? They write all of these servers and systems to gather as much data as they can possibly gather. Um, I understand why sysadmins are like that. I, Believe me, I've worked with computer people for a long time now. We've got to break you of that habit. If you really care about freedom, you have to think about what information do you really need to get your work done, what information don't you need, and how long do you need it for. Collect the information, only the information that you need, use it the way you need to use it, and then get rid of it. Um, because one of the worst problems with Patriot, and I talked about the, the libraries are having this problem under, there's a Patriot Act section called 215, uh, that, that was just challenged by the ACLU, yay. Um, uh, but we'll see how they go with it. Um, that requires libraries to turn over this information. Um, but frankly, with these subpoenas, these various kinds of subpoenas and other tools, lots of people are being asked to turn over this kind of information that they have about other people. Um, and one of the things that the Patriot Act did was it made clear something that was unclear in the law, 
Um, it used, it's clear that the government needs a warrant, which means the judge has actually looked at the situation in order to get the content of messages that you might have on your systems. Um, what was unclear in the law beforehand was what's, what did the government need in order to get all the other stuff, the logging information, the, the login, all the, other, the, all the other information that you have about a transaction other than the actual content of the particular messages. Um, and there had been a fight between uh, my, you know, our side of this and the government about what the standard was. Well, Patriot Act uh, you know, wasn't written by us, um, and it allows uh, something called a pen trap order, which is one of the lowest kinds of governmental things, where you basically they just run to a judge and say, here, it's all filled out correctly, sign it. And the judge can't even say, wait a minute, this looks crazy to me. If it's filled out correctly, they have to sign it. And then they can turn it over, and they can get all sorts of logging information. That includes your Google searches. They can you know, or any kind of searching you do any, on any site, um, if it's logged and it's available, then you got to turn it over. Uh, then the, the person who has it has to turn it over. Um, so the best and the easiest thing to do, both in terms of your headache, your time, and other people's freedom, is not to have it. So that when they show up, you don't have anything. And you can explain why you don't have anything. Um, and, and one of the things that we've seen with the RAAA stuff is that the ISPs are starting to put a, a, f a dollar figure on how much it costs to recreate their records and go through all their backups and find all that stuff for people. It's really expensive. Um, and I've worked with some individuals as well who've gotten subpoenas for archives of news feeds and other things that they have. Um, and it's darned expensive to go back and do that kind of forensic work. Or if you do it yourself, it's a, it's a lot of time. So you can save yourself a lot of hassle and a lot of time. And you can protect the privacies of the people who's, who, who are using your system <laughs> if you just don't keep anything you don't need. Um, you? Um, in the UK, we have the Red Bill. And I was wondering if in the United States we have any laws to require the top to be kept. We do not. This, we do, the question is, uh, in the UK, there is a bill that is being passed to try to do uh, data retention. And uh, some folks in the UK have done a great job of trying to, to knock that thing down, although I'm not sure they're going to succeed, but we're, we're rooting for them. Um, in the United States, we have no affirmative requirements that you keep logging information or any data about your users on your computers. Yes, once you get a once you get an order from the court that says, or from a subpoena that says, we want this information. If you thereafter go and destroy things, then you're tampering with evidence, and you can be liable both civilly and criminally. But before the request comes in, you've got no ongoing free-flowing duty to keep data. There aren't any. We're very concerned that, the, 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 that law enforcement's going to try to get it, and now they're going to probably have the RAAA's backing. But in the meantime, we cannot log, you know, and, and we'll fight that battle, and we'll fight it hard, and you'll all hear from us because we'll be screaming for help. Um, So, so the, the police can make you start logging user information in the UK. Um, you could probably get a specific sort of order to do that in the US, but frankly, it is, a, it is contrary to the general tide of the way the American law works. American law in both civil side and frankly on the criminal side doesn't generally require affirmative acts of changing systems or doing anything um, in, in order to assist law enforcement or civil people. Um, we had this fight in the Replay TV case. Some of you may have followed the Replay TV case where uh, this is, a, um, this is a, a situation where the TV studios and the movie studios were, were wanted to require Sonic Blue, the company that makes Replay TVs, to affirmatively start tracking what their users were doing with the boxes to find out whether they were engaging co in um, commercial skipping and sending shows around, which were the two main things that they were concerned about. And um, the, the initial ruling from the court was very bad. Uh, it was appealed to the higher to a to, to a higher judge. Uh, we joined in the fight at that point. So did a bunch of other people, and we got the right ruling out of the second judge, which is there is no general duty, even under the discovery laws in the U.S., for you to create new information, create new data in order to assist in a discovery dispute. Um, and the same is generally true in criminal law, although they can get those orders a little easier in criminal law than they can in civil. But they have to get the order. There is nothing. They, that, you have to go judge for that. You can't just do that. The best that they can do without going to a judge is to make you freeze and not get rid of anything that you already have at the time you get hit with the order. Yes? If they do that, can you give them a bill? Yes. If they do that, can you give you a bill? Can they give, if they do that, can you give them a bill? 
Generally, the answer is yes. Uh, the amount that you'll get paid per hour will be far below your hourly rate. I can guarantee it. And you might have to fight to get the money. But there are provisions in the law for third-party bystanders to get reimbursed for the costs that they incur in trying to comply with either civil or criminal orders. Uh, well, the court will, the, a general consultant will be 150 bucks or more. You aren't going to get what you bill. You're going to get what the court thinks is fair. And what the court thinks is fair, trust me, is not what you bill. It's going to be significantly smaller. Uh, in the back. There is nothing in Patriot 2 about document retention yet. The question is, is there anything in Patriot 2 about document retention? No. Not, not, it's not there yet. Um, and, you know, if I have my way, it never will be there. Um, the, I want to just, I've got about 10 more minutes. I want to keep answering questions, but I want to get through my what can you do stuff because we, I want, there are a couple things on there that this crowd actually, I think, can do and really ought to think about doing. Uh, we've already talked about, you know, EFF, anti-logging society. Uh, use crypto. I personally spent six years of my life fighting the federal government to free cryptography from governmental control in the Bernstein case. I wish that you would actually use it. Um, please, you guys all know how to use crypto. Find five people who don't and teach them. I had a nice man help me yesterday, actually, figuring out how to do it better on OS X. Um, and those of you who write crypto, three words, for, you know, actually, two words three times, user interface, user interface, user interface. Please help people who aren't lead to use this. The more of us that use it, it's, you know, that crowds thing. The people who actually need it can hide a little better if more people are using it. And if, we, if it's limited to just this crowd or just Linux users or just people who, who, can, who come to DEF CON, it's not very useful to anybody. So please, uh, that's my own personal appeal. Uh, please use crypto. Please teach other, either pe other people how to use crypto. And think about it no, both in terms of your communications with other folks, but using PGP disk. So, you know, my view is nobody should travel across a national border uh, unless they've got their data encrypted. We've seen far too many people, especially in my work with the human rights community, who get the laptop taken at the border and they never see it again. Um, so use, use crypto. Um, then what information... Um, what footprints are you leaving? Think about, you know, where you're going, what are you doing? Think about using services. Again, you know, we, we, I was in the, the anonymous remailer uh, system yes, meeting yesterday, and uh, I think they're great. They need more support. They need more people to use them. Please do that. It's, it's wonderful. I think, I think as a result of this, we're finally going to convince the EFF techs to let us put a remailer on our system so you can bounce off of us. I see Dan Moniz back there, my tech guy nodding, so I know that's going to happen now. See, you have to embarrass him in public, and then um, that's not his responsibility, actually. Uh, um, and then if something happens and you hear from law enforcement, please come tell us. Um, not only will we try to help you, we, we try to help people find lawyers all the time. We can't always help everyone. We're a very small organization. Um, but we do have a pretty impressive list of lawyers who have volunteered to take EFF cases, some of them for free, sometimes not. But uh, we will try to help you get connected with lawyers who actually understand enough about the Internet to be able to help you. Um, there aren't nearly as many of those as there needs to be, but we know a lot of them. Um, but also try to help them because what we're trying to do is gather evidence that we can use in the battles. When the time comes that the Patriot Act comes up for renewal, I need some stories to tell Congress about why this should go away, why this was a bad thing. And if we don't hear about them, if stuff happens and it goes away quietly, I can't marshal that evidence to try to make it so the next person doesn't get hurt. So if you hear about this kind of stuff, please let us know. We're very easy to find, um, and uh, we really do want to keep track of this. We actually uh, just recently received a fellowship to hire somebody to work full-time for the next two years, uh, a wonderful lawyer that we stole from the ACLU, um, to work full-time on post-patriot uh, civil liberties issues. So we, we've actually uh, staffed up to be able to try to help you and all of your friends if you run into these kinds of problems and we really want to do it. Um, I think, are we about done, Goon, or do I have some more time? Ten, five, a couple minutes, okay. Yes. Uh, how do I feel about uh, being in a country that was once free and, and, and now is turning into police state? Well, I, I haven't yet, but I probably will before the end of the day buy the uh, T-shirt out there that says I miss my freedom. Um, you know, this is, this is 
you know, I, I think it's horrible. You know, I would much rather spend my time trying to make your world better rather than trying to stop it from becoming worse. Um, and I'd really love to get to that place. Please, let me get to that place. Um, um, and it, it's awful. I think it's, it's terrible. I think we're really in a, in a serious backslide. Um, I'm hopeful that there have been a few things, you know, the, that, that have started. To, we've, there, there is a growing consensus in Congress that things have gone so far, too far. Um, we need to help support those people. Frankly, there are as many, there are more of those almost in the, on the right than there are on the left right now. Um, but we need to really push um, but on both sides on that. And, you know, I, I, I have to think, otherwise I couldn't get up every morning, that the pendulum swings and that we're over here now, um, but that if we work hard, we can bring it back here and uh, just hope one of these days it will be over here, right? Um, in the back. Uh, there was a bill talked about once where the using of crypto in connection with a federal crime would provide a five-year additional chargeable fine on its own. No, that's part of Patriot 2. I, I, you know, you guys started asking questions. I didn't get the rest of Patriot 2. But that's part of Patriot 2, and it's one thing that we're very worried about. It would be a mandatory uh, sentence enhancement for the use of crypto, uh, which is written so broadly that it appears to reach, you know, a lot of firewall yeah, activity. It's a separately chargeable crime. It could be charged even if the original one didn't go through. No, the, the, at least the one in Patriot 2 is a sentence enhancement. So if, you were, if you're convicted of one crime and there was crypto used, then you get a five-year... Uh, ding on top. It's not good, but it, it's not a separate crime anymore. The thing that was floated right after um, after after September 11th that um, that uh, um, would have made crypto a separate crime died really fast, and it did in large part because this community rose up. I don't know if you know this, but lots of people rose up and said, "Don't you, you know? Over my dead body, you'll touch our crypto. We worked too hard to get it free." So I think you know that makes me happy that. Uh, you know, we were able to stop that backslide, um, and it makes me feel like crypto's on pretty solid ground now. Um, you know, they're still gonna, sentence enhancements are bad, and we need to fight those. But the the dark days, um, I think, I think it's just not politically expedient to try to go back to those days right now. And the fact that we survived a terrorist attack without that, it gives me hope. Um, yes. Yes, I, you're right. He said, what about financial institutions and logging? And he's right. I should have made a, a, a small caveat to that. There are, uh, you know, professional financial institutions uh, have some requirements that are SEC requirements that they keep information about trades and shares and stuff. Um, that still doesn't mean that they have to keep a lot of things, right? Uh, they don't have to keep everybody who just shows up on their website. Uh, but they do have to keep a certain amount of data. Um, um, and um, th they have they have some re data retention requirements, but they're about the only ones. Um. Yes, they are for trades. Anything trade related, they are supposed to track. And, and the, there was a recent ruling that the, are, are they, do they have to log instant messenger things for traders? And the answer is yes. Anything involving in financial trades has a data retention requirement. There was a recent ruling out of the SEC that says. It doesn't matter what technology you use. If it's a communication about a trade, you need to track it. Um, you know, uh, it, and and that's the rule. Um, and it, it's it's really designed to try to stop the kind of cook the book sorts of things that we've seen with our corporate our corporations right now. Yeah. Yes. Is the rule effective now? I, I think it's effective now. In fact, I think it was already effective in. in uh, it it, yeah, it was already effective before. Uh, the law passed and they just issued a clarifying ruling that said I am inc are included in what the rule already said. In the front? Are people treated differently um, in the case of if you just hack directly from the United States to another box in the United States versus someone that bounces a few hosts around the world and then comes back to the United States? Are you treated differently if you go just from one box to another box in the U.S. or if you go bouncing around a bunch of hosts and then end up in the U.S.? Well, I think I mean, there's a, there's a double-edged sword. I mean, if you go bouncing around a bunch of posts and then end up at the U.S., you might be harder to catch. Um, but I think that you could also engender potential liability in all the other places. Um, and so one of the things that we've seen the U.S. do in non-hacker context is kind of, uh, you know, I don't know what you call that, jurisdiction washing, you know, where they'll, they'll send somebody to another jurisdiction where things are a little uh, tougher if they don't qualify under U.S. laws. Are they able to, like, grab logs? Of, you know what I mean? Like, it, of course, it depends on, on wherever you came from. But, I mean, it's, they are, are they getting more jurisdiction foreign-wise to grab logs? From yes. The answer, are they getting more jurisdiction to grab foreign logs? Yes. They already had, actually, quite a bit. 
um, of jurisdiction, but now Patriot Act makes that more explicit. But more importantly, what they do is they have uh, all sorts of friendship agreements with other governments, and they they uh, they they hand stuff off voluntarily to each other. Yeah, those connections in the last couple of years have really gotten much more routine. Talking to people in the Department of Justice that do this work, they have much tighter ties with overseas authorities than they did five years ago. Yeah, that's uh, Fred Von Lohman, our senior intellectual property attorney, is pointing out that uh, the, uh, that the ties between the U.S. Justice Department and foreign, uh, their foreign compatriots in the last few years are much, much tighter than they, they used to be. Um, and it, it makes, makes, them, makes jurisdiction hopping much easier for them to track because they just call their friend Louie in Italy and, and get the information they need. You want the end? You talked a little bit about people who, um, train people who end up committing terrorist acts. What about people who write anonymous censorship resistant systems which are intended to you know, protect First Amendment uh, rights but end up also we know could be used by terrorists to uh, get away with things without getting caught. Yeah, so the question is what about people who build systems uh, that protect people's anonymity and do other things that, that you know are used for legitimate purposes but could also be misused for illegitimate purposes. Um, that's actually one of my hypos that I didn't get to. Um, but um, I, the answer is I think that as long as there are a lot of general purposes for your system, it's going to be hard for them to track back to you. It doesn't mean that they couldn't get to you, though. I think the law is vague enough, and it hasn't been decided. Um, you know, that's exactly the kind of thing that you should call us. Um, but um, you know, it's our position, and I think it would be. You know, I think we'd have a really good shot at it. That if you're running a general purpose anonymity tool, especially in the United States, you know, we have a First Amendment right to anonymous speech in this country that has been upheld over and over and over again, including just last year by our Supreme Court. Um, I would go to the wall on that one. I think I think the general purpose. The thing you want to think about is keep it general purpose. If you're really if you're really customizing something for a particular illegal purpose, you're going to have a much harder time. Um, and you'll hear this as a theme. I think when you look through all of EFF stuff about technology, is um, really think about you know legal uses for whatever you're developing. Um, develop such that they can they can happen and they do happen that you've got a really good argument that you're developing a tool and that the tool could be used for le legal or illegal purposes and if you're customizing it and aiming it think about the difference between Napster which only let you change mp3s and Morpheus where we won the case um, due to a lot of different changes but one of the big changes that, that was different between Napster and the cases that have survived is that the technology could be used for a lot more purposes and the argument that it could be used for a lot more purposes carried a lot more weight because it, it, in fact it was being used, it is being used for a lot of legal purposes. I think the same is true on the criminal side. If there's potential criminal liability for somebody misusing a tool that you make, you need to really think hard about making sure that there are legal uses too and that they're actually happening. Um, and you'll be in a much better place to stand up in front of a judge and say, this is the tool I made and this is why I made it. And they won't be able to poke so many holes in you and say, well, yeah, actually, but you say that, but it was really about this. Um, uh, the goon is telling me that we're done. I'm going to go out into the hallway and I'm happy to continue talking to folks. Also, please come at 6. Um, I'm work. What? Stumble in and bumped your head. If not for me, then you'd be dead. I picked you up, put you back on solid ground.